Hey everyone, welcome back to the Going Scared podcast. This is your host, Jessica Honiger, founder of the social impact fashion brand, Noonday Collection. Well, we are nearing the end of our series on resilience. And I know that these conversations during my hard days, my days when I seriously just wander around my house and think, when is this all going to end? Or I am driving around with my mask on and I'm thinking, when is this all going to end? These conversations from people who have risen back from difficulty in the most profound ways have inspired me towards hope on those days that have been really hard. And today's story is no different. Today, I am talking with Rebecca Bender. Rebecca Bender was a varsity athlete and honor roll student with a promising future when a young man pretending to be her boyfriend lured her down a path that she never imagined existed. For nearly six years, Rebecca was beaten, brainwashed, told when to sleep and what to wear, and was traded and sold across the underground world of sex trafficking in Las Vegas. Forced into a sisterhood that she thought was family, Rebecca didn't know a way out. But in her despair, she found hope, and she found the hope that she needed to survive. Today, we talk about Rebecca's story of escape and her decision to go back to the darkest places she had known to help other women Find freedom. Rebecca Bender now assists FBI and law enforcement across the country in some of their toughest human trafficking cases throughout her nonprofit, the Rebecca Bender Initiative. She's also the founder of Elevate Academy and lives with her husband and four daughters in the Pacific Northwest. And we talk about her newest book, In Pursuit of Love. I know we have so many shared passions and I am just thankful for your own vulnerability. And I hope this can be a space for vulnerability for you. You are so brave. And as you know, this is called the Going Scared Podcast. So we're all about courage and you truly are a courageous woman. And I want to be sensitive to your story, but I also know that you share about it so openly. So I'd love to just hear what you're comfortable sharing from the period of time that you were in Las Vegas. Let's just start there. Yes, I started sharing my story publicly a long time ago because I wanted to sound the alarm that trafficking was happening in every community, you know, across America. I think most people think of human trafficking, they envision kidnapped, white minivan, you know, children in foreign countries possibly, or handcuffed to a radiator. And what people don't realize is two things. One is that actually doesn't, that doesn't sell. Mm -hmm. Right when you're t- when you're thinking of human trafficking, it's it's sex for sale, and so traffickers want to keep their product sellable. So in America, in a in a developed country where sex for sale is really rampant, that type of um, scenario isn't isn't really what's selling. And the other thing people don't understand is that as survivors of trafficking, we grew up in the same culture as all of you, so we too are envisioning white minivans and kidnapping. And when our situation mm. doesn't look like that, we don't think to even ask for help, or we don't even realize that we're, you know, getting that the water's heating up around us, that it's getting really dangerous until it until it's a point of being very dangerous. And then you realize, like, oh, I didn't why didn't I see this sooner? So then you feel stupid, you feel embarrassed. Mm. Um, you just self-blame, like, well, I got in the car, well, I got on the plane, you know, I just have a bad picker. You know, you hear women sometimes say that when they've been in bad relationships. And and so Vic survivors domestically, we're exact we're the same. We're the same as you guys. And we end up having those same so same those same things play out in our own minds. Mm. So tell us a little bit for those of us that are unfamiliar with your story. Um, why don't you share a little bit about your story? Yeah, I grew up in a small, small town in Southern Oregon, just an average kind of all American small town kid, blue collar family. My dad worked at the local lumber mill. Uh, My mom taught aerobics on the side. And 
I just grew up with a normal childhood. I grew up skipping rocks at the river and having swim holes and, you know, jumping off of the little swing in a tree into the river. Um, I was an only child, was real close with my cousins. I'd, you know, go out to the garden with a salt shaker and pick a tomato and just normal kind of small town farm kid. Um, I had a praying grandma, but I was not raised uh, in a faith-based home. My dad and mom actually kind of partied a lot on the weekends. And I can remember going to friends' houses and the parents would be all out in the living room having a drink and the kids would be in the backpack playing Nintendo. And that was just kind of my life growing up. When I was nine, my parents divorced. It was a really ugly divorce. Um, a lot of throwing things against walls, a lot of screaming, a lot of um, fighting. My dad started drinking really heavy. And I can remember someone would knock at the door and he would have me hide all the alcohol. And and now that I'm obviously older and hindsight's 2020, but you do this work when you're working through your trauma to build resiliency. And you, you realize that there were these, these pivotal moments that took uh, root in your heart that actually, you know, almost like lies took root that you didn't realize as a kid. And I think in some of those moments, I, I started realizing, um, or I was taught rather that, you hide secrets in this home, right? You you self-medicate and then you hide it. And, and that's kind of what was modeled for me. By the time I was uh, starting high school, things had turned around. My mom had got remarried and I was a varsity athlete and honor roll student. Um, also didn't have a lot of boundaries. You know, it was just kind of, I was a, you know, I was an only child, a latchkey kid. And I just kind of raised myself. I'd walk myself to and from practice and I was always full of adventure. I wanted to get out of my small town and be the first girl after a football game to jump in the back of a four-wheel truck and head to the bonfire with beer. And <laughs> I mean, yeah. just kind of, you know, I, I like to be involved in things. That's why I liked sports. That's why I liked school. I was uh, real gregarious. You know, I was a cheerleader and a goal. I was the goalie on the varsity soccer team and just real mm. involved and active. And, and so when I found uh, myself pregnant at 17, had my daughter at 18, things changed. You know, I couldn't, you can't be as active. You can't be as involved. And um, I'm not using that as an excuse. It just was the reality as a, as a 17, 18 year old girl to start realizing mm-hmm. that life, life was going to be very different. And all these dreams and ambitions that you have, were going to have to change. And so you're kind of grieving the loss of those ideals and trying to navigate being a single teen mom. Um, that's hard. And giving up your mm-hmm. do- dorm room at college and um, staying in the small town and thinking, okay, what what now? And that's when I met the most amazing guy. He was charming and he was fun and he was ambitious and he had all these big dreams too. And he wasn't from my area. And so he seemed like, you know, the older cool kid that um, took an interest in me and my daughter. And mm. everything was about us and we and, um, brought me into something that made me feel be- like I had a belonging and I had, um, he had these big I- ideas of, you know, getting out of the state, out of town and, and just building something great. And I got swooped up in that, in that vulnerable time of my life. I got swooped up in that excitement and I just fell head over heels in love, just this in love 19 year old girl. And then he told me that his job was relocating him. And that families didn't move, didn't live in Vegas. And I can remember thinking, he thinks we're family. And so Mm. I begged to go, not knowing that he was actually a trafficker and that he wasn't even the age he said he was. He didn't have the job he said he was. I mean, complete fraud. And when you look at the, at the definition of human trafficking legally, when you're actually trying to prosecute a case and you can, we can get into this later, but when you're prosecuting a case, you're looking, Law enforcement and and attorneys look for three things. They look for the use of force, fraud, or coercion at point of recruitment Mm. and at point of destination. And so that's something that I think we don't understand is we're looking for kidnap, right? I was, I'm an eighties kid. I grew up being taught stranger danger, look out for the white minivan and a puppy and someone offering you candy in the back seat, you know, and you're not taught what to look for when someone's a con artist, when they're using fraud, um, Mm-hmm. A point of recruitment, pretending to be someone they're not. Sociopaths do that. They actually mirror uh, exactly what someone else needs in order to fit that need 
in order to get what they want. That's a very common tactic with sociopaths. And I just didn't know. I'm a small town girl. You, you weren't taught to look for these things. And when I got to Vegas, um, it became not at all what he had what he had promised. Tell us about that. You get to Vegas. Your little girl is with you. And when did it become apparent that you were in an abusive situation? I mean, almost the day that I arrived, it became apparent. We, his brother had helped us move. I had met his brother lots. You know, you think that's a it's a normal progression of a relationship when you're meeting the other the other boyfriends, family, you know, if if any if everyone could put themselves back to remembering being now I'm 18, maybe 19, um, you can remember being that age and you think you're in a normal relationship and you're meeting their family and and you're, you know, getting ready to move in together. And so it feels like this natural really uh, next step. His brother helped us move. He drove the U-Haul, hooked the car to the back, and we flew in. And so I can't remember if it was the day or the next day. It was. It felt like the day that his brother arrived. Um, he said, "Get dressed up. I'm going to take you out on the town, and you know my brother's going to watch the baby." And and Vegas is so invigorating for a young girl. And I had borrowed my friend's fake ID. This was pre Jesus, so no judge. <laughs> There's no judging, right? This was pre Jesus. There's no judging anyway. There's no judging any. This is a judgment free yeah. zone. So we. I borrowed my friend's fake ID and I got dressed up and um, he drove me to this dead end street. And I can remember um, pulling up along the curb. He kind of flipped his car around and parked the truck along the curb. And there was this big deserted strip mall. There's no lights, no signs, just this gray deserted strip mall. And he said, um, I spent a lot of money to get you here. I put first and last on the apartment, uh, went over the things he paid for. And, and he said, I, that was money I was using for my job and I, I need to get that money back. And I remember feeling um, embarrassed, kind of like, "Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't. I didn't realize how much it costs to move halfway across the country. I, I don't want to seem like the young, you know, the young naive girl at 19 when he's this older professional executive and businessman." And 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 so I said, "Yeah, I need to get a job. Whatever we need to do." And um, he had already, I had already pushed my boundaries um, with hypersexuality. I'd already, you know, tried dancing as a single mom, he continued to encourage it. And traffickers do that. They'll gradually expand your boundaries. Um, it's never mm -hmm. this black and white, you know, like we see on Law and Order. It's like she, they meet a, a guy at the mall and next thing you know, she's in a miniskirt and fishnets. And um, it, it actually takes a lot more time than 43 minutes, right? And so that's, that's why episodes go so quick because they don't have that much time. But in real life, you know, traffickers take their time to really expand your boundaries little by little by little. And, and so I thought, okay, yeah, whatever we need to do. And he said, well, this is an escort service. I need you to go in and sign up. And I said, escort, that's prostitution. And he goes, no, 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 this is just dancing. This is, it's just like dancing. It's just like doing those private parties. And um, this is how it works in Vegas. This is how they get girls you know, in bikinis at those really fancy suites where there's bowling alleys and basketball courts in the hotel rooms. And that's just how it works here. And I thought, yeah, I'm not, I'm from a small town, but I'm not that naive. Escorts prostitution. And no, that's where I draw the line. You want me to go dance? I'll go dance. But I, I, escorts prostitution. And that's when he slapped me across the face. And he said, you're going to go in that room and you're going to get my money back. And I can remember having this moment of Obviously, you're being hit for the first time as a 19-year-old girl by someone that you love. And so there's mm -hmm. this moment of real sadness. Mm -hmm. And then I remember feeling this like splash of cold water in the face of, I don't know where my baby is. I don't know my address mm -hmm. by heart. I didn't write it down and send it to home to my mom. I didn't, like, I wouldn't even know where to tell anyone to take me if I jumped out of the car and ran and my, you know, what I thought was my go into the club gear. He's in tennis shoes. I'm in high heels. Like I just, I wanted to say, okay, well maybe I can trust him. I love him. It's going to be fine. I can trust him. When I got in that escort service room, it was a whole bunch of women, phone girls at these um, desks like butted up together. And on the wall, there was a dry erase board. It had categories, blonde, brunette, redhead, Asian, exotic, and all these kind of like stripper names underneath candy, Bambi, you know, I mean, I apologize if anyone listening's name is Adams, but it, it, they had names that would align with this um, this front for being 
personality but, type. Yeah, yeah. And, and the and the front of being a dance a dancing service, right? And so I thought, okay, well, this mm -hmm. is like a this mm -hmm. is like a dance club because in a, in a strip club you also have a board with your name of who's next on set, and so you're like, okay, well, this kind of mm -hmm. looks similar. And the lady pulls out paperwork and. It, you know, it's like the medical paperwork. It's all this fine print. No one's really reading it. And you're kind of just initialing next to each thing. And you're just kind of skimming, pretending like you're reading. And the lady says, it just says that you won't solicit sex. We don't hire those kind of girls. And it was like, see, I can't believe him. Okay. Maybe I, maybe I, maybe he is right. Maybe this will just be how it works in a big city. But, um, it wasn't, it wasn't dancing at all. And, um, I can remember the, that very within a, within an hour getting our first call, within moments even getting our first call, and so within the within an hour, um, realizing that this was not what I was tricked to believe, um, holding my daughter pretty much hostage, even even if he didn't say the words, it was that implicit "we have your baby" type of feeling, mm -hmm. um, and I just remember thinking, I just want to get back to yesterday. I just want to get back to this place of being excited and in love and finally have this family that, you know, broke a nine-year-old me really wanted. Um, and the ambition and, and sense of like, I finally met someone that had all the answers and, and the other option felt like I didn't want the dream to slip away. And I thought, well, maybe this will get better tomorrow. Now I've made the money, the moving money back. Tomorrow it'll be better. You know, and you, you justify and you rationalize staying in bad situations, um, whether it's a job that you've witnessed sexual harassment at, you turn the other cheek and you think, I'm gonna, it'll get better tomorrow. And you know, that guy will get end up getting fired, or or whether it's staying in a toxic friendship and and you can and you know that it, even though you've been friends for a very long time, that this might not be what God has. And you think it'll get better and I'll keep praying for her. And so I think we all have moments where we have justified a really bad situation and hoped that it would get mm -hmm. better. Um, and I was no different in that moment of being 19, <laughs> thinking it'll get better mm -hmm. tomorrow. Uh, it'll get better tomorrow, but it didn't. What are some of those tactics of abuse that kept you in this enslaved, both physical situation and even in your mindset that you were trapped? You know, I think traffickers are, they're very good and calculating. Um, they're being very thoughtful of their plan. They're a, they're a long-term con artist. They're not, you know, this isn't a crime of passion. This isn't a, a, a rageful night of we're going to abuse a girl and then put her through this honeymoon. You know, they're, they're actually very calculating in the way they continually feed your lies. Uh, I can remember getting to this place where I felt like as quickly as I tried to remind myself with truth was as quickly as he would refill my cup back up with, well, now it's because of this. Well, now it's because of that. Well, you know, now it's the drugs. Now it's, and a lot of people say, why didn't you just run? Like, why didn't you call your mom for help? Why didn't you, why don't you just tell somebody? And my answer is I did run. That's why I'm standing here. Like I did eventually uh -huh. run. That's why I'm here. One of the girls I was trafficked with, she's still being trafficked. Like I, I did run. Mm. Uh, why didn't I run sooner? Well, I learned over the years that passed, I learned patterns of behaviors and I started catching on and, and I did try to run. I had multiple attempted escapes. I learned that post 9-11, um, you can't buy a plane ticket with cash. I don't know if most people don't know that because I got all the way to the airport with mm. my baby and they wouldn't sell me a ticket. And I can remember just like begging them to let me have it. That I here's you know I have the money and like we only take credit card. I'm thinking my trafficker didn't leave me a debit card. Like, what are you talking about? You know, and and just those panic moments when you're when you're running for your life with everything you own in a bag. It's you're not always thinking clearly. I mean, anyone who says why didn't you mm. just run? Of course you would think that you're thinking from a healthy adult brain. I'm thinking in the moment right. from a traumatized, beaten, brainwashed, uh, the you know fight. I'm in fight, flight, or freeze mode. I'm in trauma mode. I, I've got a little, mm -hmm. I've got a baby. I have to worry. Like it, it's it's not as simple as someone who's thinking from like a really safe, healthy moment of why didn't you just run? And so mm. I think we forget that we forget 
brainwashing is a very real thing. Uh, why did everyone drink the Kool Aid in Waco? Mm -hmm. Why did how did they how did Marilyn Manson get people to do all those? Like brainwashing is very real, mm -hmm. and we all think mm -hmm. we'd be smart enough to recognize, but it's such a slow indoctrination. Um, Actually, Hitler said, keep the lie simple, keep it small, and keep saying it, and eventually they'll believe it. Mm. And that, that for me, when I visited um, the Holocaust Museum, it hit me to see this was a, a person who convinced a grown adult, you know, the president, the, the, the chancellor of Germany, he convinced him to come in to his regime. And they thought, well, we're going to keep an eye on him by bringing him in closer. And yet it took 12 years to slowly indoctrinate so many people and and you think about traffickers that's how they it's that same spirit of manipulation in order to 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 meet their own agenda and so that's what they do with victims it's the slow tactics of abuse it's saying lies over and over it's mantras that you'd have to repeat it's sleep deprivation it's food deprivation and so you're not thinking with a really clear brain mm -hmm. How many years did you remain in that cycle of abuse? I was there for almost six years. Um, about, six years. God, mm -hmm. that's a long time. Almost six years. I was traded between three different traffickers in that time. I have been to jail um, multiple times, arrested on multiple occasions for solicitation-related charges. I've been branded twice. So two of the men tattooed their names on my back like a piece of cattle so I could be returned if I ran. I've had my face broken in five places. Uh, my palate cracked, my nose twice, my maxillofacials and turbinites impounded, and um, I became addicted to drugs. I was very, very hopeless, and I tried to kill myself. Uh, my, my family sh came and took my daughter from me. They thought, she's on drugs. Something's. Everyone always knew something was wrong, but no one thinks human trafficking. Mm -hmm. That's kidnapped kids in other countries, right? And no, no small mm -hmm. town family. I don't think any family, but I think even a, a small farm town family, twenty years ago, you didn't think it was human trafficking. They're like, "Is she a stripper? Is she on drugs?" And you're like, "Yes, all of the above." Because I'm being forced to. <laughs> it's a difference. It wasn't vice versa, mm -hmm. you know. Tell us about the day that federal investigators raided the home that you were in. Well, we knew. Um, we knew that we were being watched by the feds um and actually what's really great that people you know i was in i was ended up being recruited into this um organized crime family for three years i was in this this last um trafficker i was with for three years which is the longest that i was with the other two and in this home there was three other women my daughter and another child and so for three years you create this real sense of family it's very much uh, like a cult. Mm -hmm. um, actually, in Northern Colorado University has proven that domestic human trafficking fits every indicator of cult behavior. And so you form these trauma mm -hmm. bonds with not just your abuser, but also the other women, right? They're the ones that are, they're, they're with you on the street. They're having your back. They're helping you get out of dangerous situations. And, and then you're doing life throughout the day. So now I can remember birthday parties with with my quote unquote sister. I can remember Christmas morning with our kids. Like there's part of you that feels this this survivor kind of guilt if you were to leave, that you're not just leaving, you know, him in this danger, but you're you're leaving the only friends you've had and this family you think loves you regardless of your past. And and he would make sure you felt that like no one's gonna love you but us. No one's gonna um, love you despite all you've done. It's only us. We know all of you, and and we mm -hmm. love you here. And you're well, you know, you're welcome here. And that's that's not always how the world makes you feel, and that that's not always even how the church makes you feel sometimes, right? And and your family might not even make you feel like that. And so it's easier to sometimes stay in a place where you have a sense of belonging, of real belonging, regardless mm -hmm. of what you've done. Um, that can be really attractive to people who have who are living um, through situations that that the world would say is really shameful, right? You're a prostitute. That the stigma it's it can be um, it can be crippling, and so and so here we are. We're in this you know really tight knit cult like family. You have to repeat mantras. You you know you're mm -hmm. you're all having the same same branding, and um, and our neighbor actually tipped us off. 
And so you know, we always say, if you see something, say something. And I think we've all heard that when we're learning about trafficking or especially during the Super Bowl, there might be an ad in an airport, see something, say something. And and in time, sometimes it's like, well, well, what does that mean exactly? But in this case, our neighbor saw something suspicious. She said, we've got a whole bunch of young girls. They drive really fancy cars and one man, they must be drug dealers. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> and so she called, she had a friend, I guess, in law enforcement. I think they were at an event and she said, I think my neighbors are drug dealers. And he looked into it and he immediately knew it was an organized human trafficking ring. And he, wow, yeah, I mean, immediately. It's, it was immediate uh, ide identifiers for prostitution. Um, and so he thought, you know, RICO Act, racketeering, bank fraud, money laundering, tax evasion, which is what organized crime, you know, gets charged with. So they sent it to the feds and the feds began an 18 month surveillance operation which we didn't know about oh. until one day one of the girls saw um our trash man hand a bag of trash to a guy like in a suit and so the next trash week our trafficker went out and a and violently aggressively i should say not violently aggressively approached our trash man and said what's going on and he said i don't know man every week some guy with a badge takes your trash and at that point we knew we were being watched and so yeah. He started having us burn everything, burn receipts, burn paperwork, burn photos. Um, and one morning, uh, they raided a home in Dallas, Texas, so up in Denton, North North Dallas, and they came with search uh, search warrants and two um, arrest warrants for two of the victims. They thought we're going to take these two victims in, we're going to pressure them to talk, they're going to talk, and then we'll nail the bad guy because we'll have victim testimony. That was their their goal. But when they raided the home, there was only one girl there. I was with um, the second girl. We were up in Vegas. So within a few months, at that point, we knew they had a warrant for her arrest. And and within a few months, uh, federal marshals had come up to Vegas and taken her. And I took the kids and jumped a fence um, and sat in our neighbor's backyard at about six in the morning until I got a phone call that it was safe to come home. And then we went and lived in hotels uh, for a few months. Yeah, it's pretty insane. It is. And I just, I deeply appreciate you sharing your story. How did you process that freedom? How did you begin to remember your past once you were free? You know, I mean, in the middle of all of this, this is the cool, this is how much I, God is so good. In the middle of all of this, God, God was pursuing me. And I had a praying grandma. I'd done Awanas as a little girl. I went to vacation Bible school as a little girl. I said the little sinner's prayer at seven. You know, you want to take Jesus in your heart. And, um, and so when Jesus started pursuing me throughout all of this, I started having radical little, little encounters with God. And I started thinking, is this God thing real? Like, is this God thing my grandma used to talk about actually real? Or am I high? Like, that's what I thought. My, I am really high today. And, mm -hmm. and about halfway through my trafficking, I got radically saved and delivered from drunk addiction in the blink of an eye. And I knew in that moment that I knew that I knew that God was real and no one could, you, you couldn't argue. You know, sometimes we argue theology, we get into apologetics, we do all the things, but I had a radical encounter with Jesus that I, I knew what happened that day. And you can't debate that. You can't, you can't debate your own lived experience, you know? And so when I got out, finally, I remember hearing the voice of God imme again immediately. It's like as soon as I opened my Bible, I could hear him. It's like my father just ran to meet me right where I was at, uh, like he did with the prodigal son. And it was this moment that I realized you know, sometimes we can feel like we're supposed to clock in a certain number of hours in prayer before you can hear God, or, you know, God doesn't talk to sinners, or um, all of these, I think, limitations and boxes that we can put God in. And it felt like I finally, this relationship with my dad, like my, my, my heavenly father, my dad, um, started to started to get rekindled and i felt this actual relationship with god not just religion but real relationship with the creator of the universe wanted to pursue me and so that's when i started really trying to work through not just my trauma um but figuring out why 
And why did I live when others had died? I, I know girls that have been murdered in the streets. They've been strangled to death by buyers and thrown out in hallways and um, chopped up in a box by a serial killer. Like, this is a dangerous, dangerous world. And so I wanted to know why. And I felt like that's what building resiliency was about for me. Was it, it was about saying, all of this can't have been for nothing. And so you fight to create something greater than before. Why God? What's the purpose? I, I want to figure it out. I want to dig in. I want to go to therapy. I want to get laid hands on. I need, I need to create new habits in my life. I wanted to dig and fight to create something greater that all of this had to have been for a purpose. And I wanted to find out why. After you experienced freedom, at what point did you even use the terminology, I'm a survivor of human trafficking, or you were able to actually say, I have, I was trafficked. Was that a, a journey as well? Oh, it was such a journey. Um, I, at first, I actually didn't say it. I would say I was forced into prostitution, but I wanted to leave trafficking for like the kidnapped kids. You know, I felt like, I felt like there was this line that I wasn't even worthy uh, to be in. And I even, I, so I, I even got quoted in a book a long time ago saying, forced into prostitution, but like not a trafficking survivor, right? And so this is something we work a lot with survivors now on, on telling your story too soon. And that's a hard lesson I've learned is probably coming forward mm -hmm. publicly before I was ready and using terminology that that is inaccurate or seeing my trauma through an inaccurate lens, being pressured by people to share parts of my story at their fundraisers so they can make money. Um, that's been really hard. It's been a hard mm -hmm. journey to be like a public survivor, especially when the topic's so, um, I don't want to say trending, but everyone's starting to talk about it. It's great. That's what we want. But I think survivors are being pressured to sometimes share things before they're ready. And we have to be really thoughtful of not re-exploiting a victim for our own agenda, not tokenizing a survivor or um, sensationalizing the issue because it just fuels misperceptions. Um, and it, it continues to fuel that misperception of what trafficking looks like. And we keep then victims from reaching out for help because we're painting a picture that's inaccurate, right? And so it was hard. Um, it actually took a documentary called Nefarious, uh, pr produced by Exodus Cry, which is such a great um, circle because now I, I serve on their board. <laughs> but long time ago, yeah, yeah I watched their cool. documentary at a church event and they showed what trafficking looked like in four different countries. And one of the last one, so they went through like, I don't, can't remember, Moldova, um, Cambodia, maybe the Philippines. And then their last one in the documentary was Las Vegas. And that when it hit me that I was like, just because I lived in a culture that was um, different doesn't mean that trafficking didn't exist. It didn't mean that just because we live in a first world developed country with internet and um, different cultural stigmas that doesn't doesn't mean that I wasn't trafficked. It just looks really different based on the culture and community in which you live. And and so the more I got educated about this issue, and the more I would attend events and go to workshops and conferences and read books, um, take classes, the more I started realizing, you know, there's 25 different types of human trafficking that's proven research by the Polaris Project. And and if we're only looking for one type, we're literally going to miss two dozen other ways that it may look in your very own community whether it's illicit massage or cantinas, mm. local brothels, street prostitution, online ads, cam girls, strip clubs, pornography, any form of commercial sex, if someone else is profiting from that victim, it's a concern that we need to be sure that someone's there by choice and not force. And even with choice, it's like, yeah, mm. choice can be kind of subjective. Like, yeah, no, I want to do this, but I've been in foster care my whole life and I've been abused. And now I think this is how, you, you know, it's like, okay, well, I think people need to know they're valuable. And I want all women to know mm. that they can go after the call of God, regardless of their past, and to really figure out what that is and, and that their story matters. We all don't have the same story, but we all have a story. We all have a testimony and, um, and it matters and it's going to change. It's going to change your legacy. It's going to change your kids. It could change your community and um, it could change culture. And that's what we're really pushing to do is, is to help people see that that this exists. It's incredible because so many people 
the idea of going back to the source of their trauma is overwhelming. And yet for you, you've openly shared your story, but not you're not just sharing your story. You are the CEO and founder of the Rebecca Bender Initiative. You've gone back to help law enforcement. You've leaned into being an activist for other women who are still enslaved. When you think about some of the factors that have helped you in your path to becoming resilient and not letting your past define you, what have some of those key milestones been? You know, it sounds like one of them is is actually naming your past in a correct way, you know, that you were trafficked. And um, what are some of those other turning points for you where you began to be able to shed your past and define a new future for yourself? Such a good question. Um, yes, I think naming it, calling calling it out by name is is so important identifying lies that um you've believed that you maybe think is normal and that's just your character and that's just who you are but it might not be and so looking at the lies um that are, are kind of like the vulnerabilities that got you into situations um that's important. So not just looking at my trafficking, but going back to the childhood and be like, what did put me at risk? What were the vulnerabilities that made me at risk for this? And and being able to identify desensitization to violence in the home, right? My my family, my parents fought during the divorce and, and my mom had a jerk boyfriend before things turned around. And so you get desensitized to violence. So when I'm experiencing it with my quote unquote mm -hmm. boyfriend, I'm immediately like, well, we're adults now. This is what adults do, you know? And so identifying some of those factors that led to is really important because you can pray and seek healing over those. You can go, you know, God helped me to realize that I am valuable. I am wanted. I am important. Um, even if the divorce made me feel less than those. And that's then when the enemy sent <laughs> this trafficker into my life um, and I fell for it. But identifying some of those those lies. The last thing I would say that's been really helpful for me is doing a lot of inner inner um, inner healing work, a lot of inner like prayer work, um, coupled with therapy. I think therapy is really important. EMDR is a therapy modality that's been really successful for people who've experienced trauma. Realizing that there's different types of therapeutic modalities and finding what might work for you. Maybe it's um, equine, maybe it's mm -hmm. dance, maybe it's art, maybe it's one-on-one -on -one counseling, maybe it's EMDR, maybe it's TFCBT. Like there's all these varying therapeutic modalities. And so figure out what works for you. Don't be afraid to try some and, and be like, oh, that didn't work for me. Or um, it doesn't mean that all of them won't work. It means you got to kind of try what works for your personality. But I coupled therapy with some really intense inner healing sessions. Um, what I did was a thing called Sozo. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of a lot of different ways. I've seen churches call it all sorts of things. Kairos, Sozo. It's a facilitated guided prayer um, with a facilitator. And one thing I loved about this inner healing moment was it made me be able to get really into prayer and ask God where he was in the moments of hardship. Where were you? When he was beating me, where were you standing in the room? We all talk about like, you know, God's all, God's so powerful and da, da, da. And then when you have something bad, you wonder, why me? Why'd you allow this? Why did you, you know, you can get mad at God. And these inner prayer moments allowed him to kind of show, like, well, I was here. I was stopping him from getting a knife. I was picking up your face when you were crying on the ground. or, And it, it makes you grateful. Um, it turns your it turns your bitterness to gratitude to be able to identify that God was there and He was stepping in. We just might not have have seen it. What are the sort of situations that trigger you even now, where you realize you're responding out of a place of cynicism and bitterness as opposed to hope and resilience? Like, do you do you notice those things still? I'm I'm getting a lot better at identifying actual triggers, PTSD, actual triggers from from the trauma versus a, height, a heightened emotional response. Mm -hmm. And I think finding that line has just taken time. Um, I had a, a moment, I was in Berlin, we were doing this big training with a, a therapist, a friend of mine, and we were walking and we're talking about something and I got upset. And when we got to the event, she said, she said, I noticed back there, um, you had this real heightened emotional response to what we were talking about. Are you upset because something hurt your feelings? Or are you having a trigger because you need to process a memory? 
And I remember turning to her with tears and saying, honestly, mm. I don't know that I know the difference. Because we, we, as humans, we do have moments when something hurts our feelings. And that's okay to have a normal, healthy, it's not a trigger just because someone, you're having a normal, healthy human response to something that offend, that hurt my feelings, that, that was mean, um, you know, that was concerning. But where's that line of going, I'm actually being triggered because this is reminding me of something. And it takes a little bit to process um, those. Like, oh, this guy actually, that teacher smells like the buyer I used to have. And so his cologne itself is making me want to have a panic attack and I want to snap at someone and I want to get angry. And there's no real reason. He hasn't said something necessarily that should have been hurtful. It's just a trigger. And figuring out what that difference is and how to either process being hurt or really process a, a, an actual memory that needs to potentially, yeah, a that's harder. That's really helpful. That's really helpful, though. In your book, In Pursuit of Love, it's not only a gripping memoir, but it's a call for us to take our own journey to places that we never thought possible. So tell us, how did you sort of land on this story? That Where do you want to take the reader in your book? Writing this, writing this story was so um, fun, and I learned so much about just the publishing process. Uh, you know, you, you well know this. When you sign your book deal, you're contracted for a certain number of words. And I was contracted for around 55 to 60,000 words. And I turned in the manuscript and it was 93,000. And they were like, oh, so we're going to have to cut half of this. And that was really hard <laughs> to figure out like, well, what stories do you keep in? What stories do you leave out? Where do you really want to take the reader? I wanted people to be exposed to like bad and good sides of every person. I wanted people to see the bad cop and the good cop. I wanted people to see the bad buyer and the good, I don't want to say good buyer, no one's really a good buyer, but but the humanity and the empathy that that the father has for everybody. I wanted moments of that for people, um, but I really wanted people, I wanted to tell a story of why we're not running so quickly, because that's always the question everyone asks. Why didn't they just run? And I I hope that through this memoir, people get a much better idea of what this daily family is like, what this real sense of feeling a, a member of this, this quote unquote family can be so, um, could be so hard to leave because you feel like you're leaving all your friends behind that the guilt of what if he starts hurting her or hurting him, if I leave, um, you carry some of that. And as women, we do that naturally, right? We naturally like put others first and and put our kids first and put our friends first, put our, our parents, our, our family first. We're not choosing ourselves first often. That's a really, that's just not an innate thing we do anyway. And so in those moments of like, leave all the other girls behind to suffer and figure it out, why they all go to prison, you worry about you. That's just not how you're thinking anyway. Um, let alone you add all the trauma, you know? So it's, mm. I wanted readers to really get it, get what that would be like to live live in a world of human trafficking where you're afraid all day and you're afraid all night and um, you don't really know how to navigate normalcy. And the real fear of figuring out normalcy, how do you navigate a world you know nothing about? How do you start going to church and make friends as, a, as an mm. adult, as a 28-year-old adult? having this crazy past that people are going to look, how do you try to be a normal 28-year-old girl after all this? How do you run with nothing mm. in your name? I ran, my traffic could put all of our, um, one of our utility bills in my social and didn't pay it on purpose as a form of punishment so that when I got on my own, I had such bad credit and such debt that I wouldn't be able to get like power turned on in my own name. They do that. It's not just physical mm -hmm. violence. There's very calculating forms of punishment that they do to inhibit you from starting over. And um, it's just hard, like just navigating this whole new world is hard. And I wanted to invite people into this life and hopefully a real empathetic way. Okay, so we like to wrap up and ask everyone how they're going scared, which feels like such a trite question because you've literally escaped human trafficking and have lived a very courageous life. But I also know that we 
are constantly growing and have new boundaries that want to push us out of our comfort zone. So, so what is pushing you out of your comfort zone right now? I've been in this fight against human trafficking for almost 11 years. I serve on the National Advisory Council to Congress. I'm on a presidential advisory committee for um, all, you know, I, I've done, I work with FBI and we work cases and I take the stand and I, t and I do all these things and it's great. And I'm, I'm grateful that God's been able to turn everything the enemy had intended for harm around for his honor and glory. Um, but at some point, you, I, I want to move beyond my story, you know, like, which is hard to have a memoir come out. But I'm so much more than one bad thing mm. that happened to me 20 years ago. I'm a Bible teacher. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a mother. Um, and so I'm really excited and scared when you've, you know, I've, I've kind of closed down a couple programs of my nonprofit to really pursue um, being an author and a, and a preacher and, and, you know, a speaker. Um, and so I'm nervous about that, but I think the transition is going to be good. And anytime God leads you somewhere, he's never let me down. Um, I can trust him. I can trust when he says, shut that down. I shut it down. He's, he's the, God's voice is the best business insight you can get, right? When he's like, turn left, don't turn right. You know, trust, learning to trust that is, has been a, a journey, but I'm I'm glad I do, and and so yeah, that's how I'm going. Scared is kind of trying to move out of all of just the the law enforcement and trafficking work and move more into like ministry, where you're writing Bible studies and teaching them on, on things that don't have anything to do with exploitation. That can be scary, and for people to be like, "Are you really? Can you really teach the Bible? You you know, you were a former prostitute. Can you really do that?" And you're like, "Well, Mary Magdalene did. Why couldn't I today?" <laughs> actually recording this in real time, but I recorded this conversation with Rebecca a few weeks ago, but I still remember when she talked about naming that she was trafficked, naming that she had been victimized. There's so much power in being able to name our stories, and it's only when we can accept and name our stories that we can begin to heal from them. So I think that's an important, important thing to note for this time that we're in right now. What maybe do you need to name? What grief do you need to name? What emotion do you need to name? When we can name it, as my therapist used to say, we can tame it. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. Today's episode is produced by Eddie Kolpholtz. The music is by my friend, Ellie Holcomb. And until next time, I'm Jessica Honiger. Let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared. Mm -hmm.